Okay, so last time we mainly talk about the foundation of the convergence in law. That's what we call the Halley Bray theorem. So it has four equivalent statements. So the first one is of course what we are interested in the convergence of a random vector sequence to a random vector. So here in the general case in our class, we assume that X n and X, they are all D dimensional. Okay, and the other three statements are regarding the convergence of the expectation of some real value function in D dimensions. So, they are all about this. Some G function that maps from D dimensional to real values. And B and C and D are for different classes of G. Sorry, let me switch. Okay, so what is B and C and D? So specifically, B has the classes that are continuous and vanishes outside a compact set in RD. So this is the smallest class, and then C is bigger. It's for G continuous and bounded. Okay, and for D, we make it even more general. We replace continuous function to measurable function. With a condition that the limit must be in the continuity set of G, where G is continuous with probability one. So as long as this satisfies, then we don't need to require G to be continuous. We just need it to be measurable. But this is from a mathematics perspective. In reality, right, the functions G you can encounter will almost surely be continuous function. You will not really easily see a measurable but not continuous function in, in many practices. But here, the D here is the case for us to easily prove A. And then we, last time we said A can go to B and B can go to C and C can go to T. So we didn't talk, have time to talk about how to go from C to D, but it, it involves mostly technicalities and you can check the notes for the proof. So Halibre is the foundation. And with Halibre, you see, we are actually able to expand our definition of the convergence in law from simply the expectation of the indicator function, which is the definition of the CDF, to the expectation of function G at Xn, right? So these G are much broader classes. And also, this also give us the foundation for the following result. We call the Levy's continuity theorem. This is what we used mostly for proving convergence in law. So in short, what it says is that convergence in law is equivalent to the convergence in the characteristic function. So this is the characteristic function of Xn, and this is the characteristic function of X. And for both characteristic functions, their domain is SRD, the same as Xn and X. For all T in RD. So just as a recap, 
what is the definition of characteristic function? So for X, its characteristic function is defined as the expectation of exponential in the power we have the imaginary unit i, t transpose x. So here x is rd, so is t. So this is the inner product between t and x, right? If we write it out, it's actually t1 x1 plus t d x d. So here, don't confuse this with my random variable sequence. Here, essentially, I'm just writing out t as a vector and x as a vector by writing out its components. Okay, so this is what we mean by the inner product. So then you can see the characteristic function takes a d-dimensional d as its argument, but its output, its value, is it's not it's not d dimensional it's one dimensional okay and also we need to say what's this what does this mean right so think about the definition of expectation if you write it out it's actually so think about this as a d dimensional integral so what I'm doing is basically taking the definition of the expectation. So it is an integral. So what's next for us to do is to prove this continuity theorem. Given the Halibre as our foundation, as our tool, can we prove the, can we prove the continuity theorem? So this direction, from the convergence in law to the convergence in the characteristic function should be straightforward because you see the characteristic function is defined as the expectation of this function, right? And you see, we can regard this function as our G of X. And because this exponential imaginary unit, this function, we know it's bounded. It's bounded. so. Therefore, it satisfies the C class. So it's continuous and bounded. So therefore, by the heavy break, we can immediately go from left to right. Okay, so, so let's just say that let G of this G function be Right, or maybe I can say this. Right, so given this G function, we know that by the Euler's formula, right, by this definition, we know it is bounded. And G is continuous. So therefore, by Halibre, we can have give us so we have this immediately okay from for the other direction how do we go from the characteristic function to the convergence in law for that we are going to show that given the convergence in characteristic function, we can prove statement B in Halibre because we have the equivalence between B and A. As long as we can prove B, we can prove A. Okay, the reason we pick B is because this is the smallest class of functions among B and C and D. So therefore, as long as we can show that for any G in this more, most specific class here, we're done. So it's easier to prove this more special case than the most general case. All right, so let's say that let G be continuous and 
vanishes outside a compact set. So with this, right, we would be able to say that only in the compact set, G may be non-zero. Outside of the set, G is zero. So that makes handling G easier. And also, these two together, continuous and vanishes outside the compact set G, on compact set, will tell us immediately G is bounded. And this is exactly why we say we said in last class that B, the functions in B is a subset of the functions in G. Okay, and so with this, then we can just give that upper bound to G. Let's call that capital B as the bound. Okay, and also continuous and only Non-zero on the compact set tells us that G is uniformly continuous, right? This is what we said last time. So this says, given any epsilon greater than zero, there exists the delta greater than zero, such that whenever we have X minus Y less than delta, we would have gx minus gy less than epsilon. This is uniform continuity. Okay, so given those nice properties of g, the next thing to show is that expectation of gxn is going to converge to expectation g of x. Okay, so to do that, and we need to make use of the the characteristic function, right? This is what we have as our condition. Then what do we do? How can we connect expectation of G of Xn? The question is, how can we connect expectation of G of Xn to this phi Xn at any t, the characteristic function, which by definition, is this, right? How can we make the connection between those two? This is an expectation. This is also an expectation. Okay, so here is a very interesting trick. And I think this trick plays a, a very important role in mathematics statistics. That is, we want to make use of Gaussian distribution or a Gaussian random variable. The reason for doing that is because if we have a Gaussian random variable, then once we take the expectation of that, because of the special form of the Gaussian density function, right? If we write out the expectation as the definition by integration, then the Gaussian density function will get into play. And we can actually show that with that integral with some interesting change of variables, and also by changing the order of integration, we are able to get an exponential term out, which is what we have here, the exponential term. So let's see how that looks like. Let me see if I can fix this echo. Hello, hello. Maybe this is better. Okay, so now we introduce Uh, zero mean Gaussian random vector. With small variance in every dimension. So you can, you can consider this Gaussian random vector as a perturbation on my XM. All right, so let me write that down as Y sigma. And this is also D-dimensional, so it matches to XM. So zero vector and sigma squared times the identity matrix 
of d dimensional. Okay, so I want this sigma to be very small, but we'll see very soon how small it needs to be. Okay, so the goal is that I'm going to show when this is very small. So I want to show that this expectation of G of XM plus Y sigma, this can make a connection to the characteristic function of XM. So this is easier to work on. And also I want to show that adding this Y sigma will not change EGXM much. And also on the other side, it will not change EGX much. Okay, so this is for XM, right? And for X, I also, I'm also going to add it and connect this to the characteristic function of X. Okay, so let's first take a look. We will do the easy part first to see that I did adding the Y sigma will not change my target, this E, G, X, N, and E, G, X much. So first of all, let's take a look at this. What is their absolute difference? And this term, you know, we are going to make use of the boundedness and the uniform continuity. We're going to use both properties. So in other words, because here, the step delta epsilon is so important, right? Controlling the domain in delta neighborhood can make sure we control the value difference by epsilon. So with this, I just divide this case into two parts. The first part is that Y sigma is less than the delta absolute neighborhood. Okay, so this is the first part. Okay. So I'm taking a difference and multiply by the indicator that Y sigma absolute value is less than delta. This is the first part. And I'm also going to have a second term. I open the absolute value. So this becomes less or equal than by the triangle inequality. Okay, so for the second part, it's mm -hmm. right. I have those two parts. And for the first part, because I already ensure that this XM plus Y sigma is in the delta neighborhood of XM. So therefore, when this indicator takes value one, I know this term, this GXM minus GXM plus Y sigma, that one would have absolute value less than epsilon, right? So therefore, I know I can, Bound, I can bound the first term by epsilon. So basically, I'm going to take another step. So right now, you see the indicator is outside the expectation, but I can move it inside the expectation. So it's expectation of the absolute difference between GXM and GXM plus Y sigma. And so we still can have less or equal than. So I'm fine here. And that's bounded by epsilon because of the uniform continuity. Okay, and for the second term, I can bound it by the boundedness of G, right? Because this term can be no greater than B, capital B, also this term. And this term is at most one, 
So therefore, I can bound the second term, sorry, I can bound the second term by moving this part out of the expectation. Right. Sorry, I think I made a mistake, my bad. Sorry, I need to change this. Sorry. I need to do this. Okay. Right. So I need to make the expectation out and also here. Okay. Okay, so the first term can be bounded by epsilon. And the second term, I know this one is bounded by B, this one is bounded by B. And by moving them out, right, their absolute difference is at most 2B. Okay, if I move this part out as a constant, then the expectation for the indicator becomes just the probability that Y sigma this is the norm for that d-dimensional y sigma vector greater or equal than delta. Okay, now it comes to where I say that I said sigma must be very small. So here, because y sigma is arbitrarily introduced, I can control how, sigma, how small the sigma needs to be, and I can make it very, very small so that I can have this term to be very small. Okay, so make sigma small enough such that this probability will be very small. And I can always do that. Um, to be. Okay. So the reason I divide this by 2b is just to make sure this product is controlled by delta, by, by, sorry, by epsilon. So then together, we would have this difference less than two epsilon. So you see here the whole logic is that we start with some positive constant epsilon. By the uniform continuity of G, we find the neighborhood in the domain delta. And this delta is the same delta here. Given this delta, we can find the sigma small enough so that y sigma will not have a will not have an L2 norm greater than delta with a large probability. Actually, we want this to be a very small probability. And the small probability is again determined by epsilon. So therefore, you see the whole thing starts from that same epsilon and then we can find delta and we can find sigma. And B is actually from just the boundedness of G. So this capital B is taken as a constant. Okay, so you see by this argument, similarly, we can have G X, minus expectation of gx plus y sigma, we can control this absolute difference by two epsilon, right? So these two parts are similar now. Then what's next is to show, so the remains, what remains is to show that expectation of g xm plus this y sigma is converging to expectation of g of x plus this y sigma. So as long as we can show this, and because epsilon is something we can make arbitrarily small and go down to zero, we prove our conclusion, which is, so with this, right? And with this and this, so those three things together, one, two, and three. So they all together, we are going to have expectation of GXM converged to expectation of GX. 
And that's statement B of Halibri. And then we prove the convergence law. Okay, so do we have any questions so far? So we haven't touched three yet, but we're done with one and two. Yes. Yes, we drop the probability. The reason is because we are taking this just as one, right? Because it's one or zero, right? So basically this is less or equal than the difference. Of, so basically we actually have this times the probability of that, but the probability is actually bounded under one. So we just keep as one, yeah. Okay, so now the most interesting part will come out. How can we relate this part, the right expectation of G of X, M plus Y sigma to the characteristic function? So now we're, we are going to see the magic. So we are going to use the definition for this expectation. Oh, and also, by the way, I forgot to say one thing, but that's essential. When we introduce the Y sigma, we make Y sigma independent of Xn, odd Xn and X. And that's something we can do because we introduce this Y sigma arbitrarily. Okay. So because of the independence, then when we do the integration, right, the joint density of Xn and Y sigma can be factorized into the density of Y sigma, which is Gaussian, and also the density of Xn. Okay, so you can write as G X plus Y, right? And the density of Y sigma, we know by the multivariate Gaussian density, it's actually to the power D because this is D dimensional and exponential negative Y transpose Y to sigma square. Here, because the mean is zero, so we just Y minus zero and that's the density for, so this is the density of Y, of Y sigma. So this is the um, PDF, probability density function of Y sigma. And also we have D, F, N, X. So this is the CDF of X, N. We just use this general notation to denote it. Okay, so, you know, to relay this to the characteristic function of Xn, this is a reminder, right? This is something we want to work with. Okay. And specifically, this is the integral form. So how can we relate this to that term? So first of all, you see, we need X to appear in the exponential power. But here in exponential power, we only have Y. We don't have X. X is only here and then here. So we want to move X out to some exponential form. And in order to do that, we use change of variable. We define U as the X plus Y. Then you can see this will become G of U and here it will become U minus X. So X is out. So with this, I move the constant to the front first. And then in the integral, the first one 
will be g of u. Okay, now I have the new variable u. And the second part, I have exponential to the power u minus x transpose u minus x to sigma square. Okay, and I still have this d f n x and now dy. Oh, sorry, I have dy here. I forgot to write that. And dy would become du because u equals x plus y. This is just calculus. Okay, so now you see we are closer to this form. We have x in the exponential power. All right, so now something we are going to use, which is very interesting, is the characteristic function of a Gaussian random vector. So the Gaussian random vector has a special form of its characteristic function. And we are going to use that to help us from here. So this is, a, I'll just call this a fact. Okay, so let's just say that Z, so this is just a different set of notation to denote, to denote the fact. It's not really related to the notations here. So we use Z. Let's say Z is a D-dimensional Gaussian variable with mean zero and variance alpha square, also independent D-dimensions. So it's a diagonal covariance matrix with, with alpha square in the diagonal and zero elsewhere. So for this z, its characteristic function, okay, we can actually write it out and show that this characteristic function would take the form exponential to the power t transpose t times alpha square over two. So you see what? Interestingly, so this characteristic function is very similar to its probability density function. The probability density function, if you write it out, it's proportional, I'll just draw the constant, to the exponential to the power negative t transpose t alpha square times two. So the alpha square will be in the denominator in the density function, but it goes to the numerator in the exponential power after we take the, we do the characteristic function. But I, I need to remind you that I'm abusing the notation. For the more familiar notation, I should use z and z and z. So you see here, z is in the domain of the, random variable space, right? So basically Z is any value that this random vector can take. And T is also D dimensional, but it's not a Z. So in other words, we can say that these two things are actually conjugate to each other. And also this is something, if you know about the Fourier analysis, this is a very interesting result. So that is if you transform a Gaussian vari random variables, density function by Fourier analysis, you will still have a Gaussian, but now the, ran, the random, sorry, the variance will be become the inverse. So here you see the variance in this function is alpha square, and here it becomes one over alpha square. So with this fact, now let's come back here. And also don't forget that this is the characteristic function of z. So given that, can we write it, write this part out by introducing the characteristic function? So maybe I'll make it clearer by writing out the definition of the characteristic function again. So this is the definition. A negative, sorry, i, no, no negative, right. i t transpose, um, Z, D, let me see, 
IT transpose D. Now I need to write this out and exponential, right? This one. And I still need to keep that constant for here. Two pi alpha to the power D. Okay. Negative Z transpose Z over alpha squared times two D Z. Okay. That's the definition of the characteristic function. And with this, now let's come back to what we have over here. So in this part, we are going to, what we are going to do is that we are going to treat, I'll get a different color. We are going to treat this part similar to what we have over here. So you see, we are going to consider this mu minus x as our t here, and we're going to consider sigma as one over alpha here. So by doing so, I can introduce this as a replacement, this whole term as a replacement of this. So I will introduce another inner integral in the whole term. And the reason for doing that is with this, now the imaginary unit will appear. So that will go into here and that will help me create the definition of the characteristic function of xn. Because in here I need dfn, which I already have, but I also need the imaginary unit here and I don't have it yet. So, but this relationship, this fact about the connection of Gaussian random vectors characteristic function and its special form allows me to introduce imaginary unit here. Does it make sense? Okay, so let's, let's, let's write it out, right? So given this fact, then this e to the power u minus x transpose u minus x to sigma square will be equal to one over root two pi. Previously alpha is here, now sigma can go here to the power d times the integral, exponential imaginary unit. Um, let me see, t stays transpose and z is going to be still Z. Um, let me see. Sorry, I know it's not T. It's imaginary unit. This T is going to be U minus X transpose. Okay. And I have this Z. And okay. Z transpose Z and two times sigma squared, this goes to numerator, dz. So you see, that's the term I'm going to introduce into here. And then you see, I created this imaginary unit times x transpose times z, which is what I need for here. So you see that, with this, the way we write it allows us to introduce the characteristic function. So basically, I will skip the detail over here, but ultimately with this fact and with this replacement, right? If we go down here, we will be able to get a term. So this is in our notes. This is a constant before the integration. And inside the integration, I'm going to have the g u, which will go down from here. And I will have the exponential i. So what I'm going to write is 
over here. So I have a U transpose and I have a Z, right? So I'm just going to write it as U transpose Z here. I have a term remaining here minus this term, Z transpose Z sigma square over two. That's my first term. And I'm also going to have here, and this part, after I put this part in, and then use this as the characteristic function, I'm going to show that I will get the characteristic function of xn at negative z. Okay, so you can show the reduction by plug this in and use this definition. And finally, I will have dz du. So this is a little bit different notation from the nodes. In the nodes, I use t, but here I use z, but it means the same thing. Okay, so the goal here is to introduce the characteristic function into our formula for this expectation of xn plus y sigma, and we manage to do so by using the special form of the Gaussian characteristic function. So now you see, to show that, we just need to show this whole term would converge to everything I copied down, except that I would change this characteristic function to the characteristic function of x. Okay, so what is this? How can we show the convergence? We, we do have the convergence point-wise from the condition here, right? The characteristic function converges of xn, converges to the characteristic function of x for any t here. So therefore, we will have pointwise conversions of this to this for any z. But do we still have the convergence after we take the integration? Actually, this is something related to what we mentioned in a previous lecture, the dominated convergence theorem. And that will play here. Because the reason is that, so if you recall, what is that dominated convergence theorem about? It's about saying, how can we go from almost sure convergence to the expectation convergence, right? And we say that we need the random vector sequence and the, we need a random vector sequence to be bounded by another random vector. And that random vector needs to have finite expectation, right? That's the dominant convergence theorem. So in other words, when we say almost sure convergence in the random vector sequence, it's very similar to here the pointwise convergence of this function series, right? For any value, we have a convergence sequence. But how about on average? And this integration is a sense of averaging. So what we need to know is that if we have this thing inside expectation bounded, bounded, then after taking the integral, it is bounded. But do we have it? Actually, we do. The reason is simply because we can show this function is bounded times exponential of this negative thing power is also bounded because it's a Gaussian density. We know there's an upper bound. And also this G function is bounded by our setup, right? It's a bounded function. So yes, everything is bounded. So now the dominated convergence theorem can help us show the convergence. Then with this limit, we just reverse all the previous steps and we can show this is the expectation of G at x plus y sigma, and we're done. So in this whole proof, I think the most tricky part is the introduction of that Gaussian random vector y sigma. So that basically gave us the characteristic function form. So to help us connect the characteristic function to the expectation of some g function we need. Okay, so 
This Lenvis continuity theorem is so crucial because it's the foundation of, or the whole rationale of why the characteristic function is so important in probability theory. So in other words, you can actually fully describe a distribution by its characteristic function, right? And we see that as long as you have the convergence of characteristic function, you have the convergence in law. And also what's different from the definition of convergence in law, if you recall, when we deal with the CDF of Xn and the CDF of X, we need to worry about the discontinuity points of the X. Oh, sorry, it's X. The discontinuity point of X, right? So, or CDF, because there may be some point masses where you have discontinuity, but you actually don't need to worry about that discontinuity when you talk about the the talk about the characteristic function. The reason is actually, if you think about its definition, this T is not a value of X. Although they are both D dimensional, but this is not a value of X. But I think if you have taken the, learned the Fourier analysis, it may be easier to understand. So for example, in the Fourier analysis, if you consider this to be the time, X to be the time, and then T will be the frequency. So they are conjugate to each other, but they're not really about the same thing. Okay, so that's the continuity theorem. And this is the most important foundation of the convergence in law. Do we have questions before we move on? Okay, so if we don't have questions, then the next topic we are going to talk about is actually, so the next major topic is that we're going to talk about the, some convergence in law of large numbers. Okay, so for law of large numbers, this is something we learned in undergrad, mathematical statistics or probability. But here we are just going to echo you are using it as an example, I should say, using this as an example for what we talk about for the four modes of convergence. Okay, so, but maybe let me try to finish a little note before moving there because we may need to use this later but we will not we'll just give a brief introduction okay so i think this is something just notation wise for notation consistency so here when we say the gradient of a real value function just for clarity So here, when we say a real value function, when we talk about its derivative, right? It maps from Rd to R. Then we say call its derivative a gradient and the gradient is D dimensional. So here we will use the notation, this a dot, one dot, but you may see some people use that inverse triangle for the gradient. So just for notation consistency, here we are going to call this gradient a row vector a d-dimensional row vector. So it's the partial derivative for every direction. Okay, so it's a row vector. And if we take another derivative, so we are going to use f dot dot x, this will become a matrix. And we call this the Hessian matrix. So still the first row will correspond to the first, um, sorry, the first row will correspond to the, this vector, right? And then we are going to do it Sorry, the first row will correspond to the second derivative against the first dimension. So we will have this partial again, partial x1, partial 
x1. Okay, fx. And the last one, partial xd, partial x1. And then last row is against the last, the dth dimension. So this is just the way we define the notations. And I think that's pretty much it. Although in the notes, we also talk about the chain rule, the product rule for derivatives of this, mult, um, of this vector functions that maps from the multi-dimensional space to one-dimensional space. But I think those are fine, right? So yeah, and also, let me see. So one thing, okay, I should say this. So what if the function is vector valued? So in other words, it maps Rd to Rk. So its value is k-dimensional. So in this case, we actually write g of x, x is rd, as a vector, g1 of x and gk of x. Okay. So in this case, once we take the derivative of g, then we will stick with this row vector notation. So in other words, g dot x will become a matrix. And the first row will be the gradient of g1. And the last row will be the gradient of gk. OK, so you see, we have a d-dimensional row. And lastly, gk partial gk partial x1 partial gk partial xd. So you see, it has um, it has k rows and d columns. Right. So the reason we introduce the gradient of a real value vector as a row vector is simply that we can easily aggregate, propagate this to the vector value function. Okay, so I think I'll just introduce notations. And so you can read the chain rule, the product rule, and the mean value theorem and Taylor's theorem for this f function, for its argument is vector. Okay, so now let's talk about consistency. So, so in statistics, right? So all the previous discussions are actually probability. But now let's move on to statistics and, and see how we can apply those four modes of convergence in our statistics. So one thing we talk a lot in mathematical statistics is this consistency. And we briefly mentioned this in our first lecture. This is a very classic criterion for evaluating an estimator. Let's say we have an estimator. Beta hat m which depends on a sample of size n. And we have a parameter, true parameter beta to be estimated. So, and all the discussion in this class is under the frequentist paradigm. So we think of theta as a fixed unknown parameter and theta hat n is a random, vec random var variable. So when we say, Consistency, we are actually interested in how the estimator would converge to our parameter. And there are two types of consistency. Weak consistency is theta hat n would converge to theta in probability. 
while strong consistency in theta hat n would converge to theta almost surely. And let's concretize these two things in our practice. So in our practice, we often only have one sample of size n. And based on that actual sample, we can calculate theta hat n as a number, right? And that's our estimator value. But what does the strong consistency tell us in that case? So just imagine that you have a sample to start with, with n data points. You can increase your sample size by collecting more and more data points. So in the sense, your sample size is going to infinity. So in that case, if you do have strong consistency, what you have is that this theta hat n realization, right? The number you compute on your actual sample will become convergent to theta. And that's the most ideal case, right? Even though you have only one sample, that as long as your sample size is very large, then the actual number you get will be close to the theta. How about the probability based on what we discussed before? For probability, you cannot say that. It's possible that in your scenario, you're just unlucky, right? Your, your observed theta n value could be off. It may not really converge to the theta. However, what this tells you is that that chance is getting smaller and smaller. So as long as your n is very large or n is larger, when n gets larger, there's a smaller chance that your theta n hat is far away from theta. So you are basically betting the probability. While here, almost surely, it's just guaranteed. So now thinking about the four modes of convergence, you can more appreciate what we're doing. So, so basically, Realizing this, I think as statistics majors or graduate students, you can better appreciate what statistics is, is really doing. We are talking about uncertainty and we are trying to can do uncertainty. So whenever we, if, whenever we give people an answer, we always bear in mind, in most cases, it is just with high probability we can say something and we can never say for sure. So that's why you see all the things about say confidence intervals or you do hypothesis testing to get a p-value, all those things in practice are related to the uncertainty. So therefore, we can never say, we think the null hypothesis holds or it's false. We never say that. We just say based on the evidence, we reject the null, we don't reject the null. That's what we say. The reason is simply because we always think there might be a small chance we are doing that wrong. But I think a lot of people, when they use statistics, they didn't realize that. They just use the number and make full story out of it, right? So thinking that this is the truth. And I think this is a very big gap between what we do in statistics and what people use statistics for, like in scientific research. We often, we are looking for truth, but we have to bear in mind that given the data as they are, we often cannot say it's wrong or is correct or wrong, we can only say with some degree of confidence. So comparing these two, the weak consistency is just with some probability guarantee, while the strong consistency is actually, it's the fact. Okay, I hope this makes sense to everyone better. All right, so this is the general discussion about consistency then law of large numbers is just a special application of it. So what's law of large numbers? I think this is most people who, under, who heard of statistics knows, right? So what is law of large numbers? It's about the average of your sample. So let's just say the only, the only, condition is that our sample is consists of n random vectors. Okay. And we assume them to be IID. So it's identically and independently distributed. 
So when we do random sampling, that's what we get. So given this random sample, and our parameter of interest is the mean of the population. So they are IID from a population with mean mu. This is the parameter of our interest. And the estimator is our sample mean, right? So to estimate the population mean, our most intuitive choice is to take the average of the end data points in our sample. That's our sample mean. So a lot of large numbers is talking about the convergence of the sample mean to the population mean. That's it. And we know that we can have convergence in probability and almost surely. Of course, we know almost surely will imply convergence in probability, but still we say it here, right? So if we just have one condition, so we need to have the expectation subject to this absolute value, right? If it's one dimension, it's absolute value. If it's d dimension, it's the norm. We have, we need to have the finite. In other words, this, these things cannot behave too crazily. They must be concentrated in some way. So that's it. And the reason why we often teach the undergraduate class to use the probability version is because the proof of the almost sure version is very difficult but the proof of the probability version is actually much easier. Okay, so, but still, I think I'm, I can just briefly recap this as just you can think about here. Okay, law of large numbers is just a special case of consistency where the estimator is the sample mean and the parameter is the population mean. And also I want to mention that in theoretical statistics, a lot of people talk about the convergence rate. So for convergence rate, they talk about this. They often worry about the weak consistency. So for weak consistency, we want, okay, so for any positive epsilon, we want this to be small. So therefore, the question to be answered here is that what is the order of this probability in terms of M? So usually people are interested in this is what? What function of M? So of course, you know that this term must go down to zero as n goes large, right? But at what rate? So it could be say n polynomial. So n to the negative alpha for some alpha greater than zero, that's polynomial. Or in some very ideal case, you want, you can have some exponential, let's say e to the negative alpha n. But this will be very fast, you know, this will be very fast decrease. Well, the polynomial is often something you will see in a lot of papers. But if we can have this as n to the negative one, that's pretty good. And but most of the time, you may only have n to the power negative one half, one fourth. That means it's actually converging quite slowly. But yeah, so these are the things you will see. And also for for a topic, right, for studying this, people call this topic large deviation theory. So large stands for large N. Deviation is this event, it's called deviation. Okay, so that's all I wanna say about the consistency. Do we have questions? Okay, so if not, then another interesting piece of result I will talk about, you know, this is the sample mean, right? We can have another type of mean. Let's think about it. So again, we're going to talk about the very important property 
or the another important way of describing a distribution, the CDF. Okay, so let's say that we have again this x1 to xn iid from a population denoted by a CDF. So f is the CDF of the population from which we draw iid x1 to xn. So what is the how can we denote f, right? So let's just say that we have this hypo. This is our sample. But we have a hypothetical random vector that also follows f. So you can think about x is just a run the general notation for the random vector, while these are n random vectors we sample from f. So that's the difference. So this hypothetical x will, will help us write down the definition of f. So recall the definition of f is the probability at x, and there's the probability that x is less or equal than x, right? So we know the connection between probability and expectation. So this is the expectation of the indicator function. This is what we know, right? And what is this? If we fix X, this is actually a population parameter itself, just as my mu. Does that make sense? Because it's just the property of the population specified by F. Right, as long as I fix my x, lowercase x, this is just a number. Fix x, okay? Then fx is a parameter. And we don't know it, but we want to estimate it. Then how do we estimate it? Think about the law of large numbers. It tells us if we want to estimate some expectation. Okay, so using that hypothetical notation, this mu is expectation of x. So what this tells us is a very fundamental idea. If we want to estimate expectation of something, we could actually calculate the something on each of our data points in our sample and then take average. Right, so then how can we estimate this fx? Following this idea, we would actually, using this, this is the something, right? We want to take expectation for. x is hypothetical, but x1 to xn is something realizable. Therefore, we just change this x to x1 to xn. So we change it and we take the average. So let's see it. I from one to n, indicator xi, right? That's what I say. We evaluate this indicator on each data point and then, then take the average. This is similar to our x and bar here. This is our estimator. And we give it a name, fn hat x just as we have the theta n hat here and here we have f n hat x and fx and still we are considering x to be fixed so therefore you see by the law of large numbers we already have f n hat x converged to fx for a fixed x and this is both in probability and almost surely. And you see the condition here will satisfy naturally because the indicator function is zero or one. So it's bounded. And we give this f and hat a name, the empirical CDF. And you will see this empirical term, this adjective a lot. Empirical basically means something constructed from your empirical sample. And this is the foundation of 
a, a huge topic. I think it's, it used to be a traditional graduate level class called empirical process taught in statistics programs, but now there's not so much more, <laughs> at least not here. But the empirical process is actually concerning this F and hat. So now we're just talking about a CDF, right? But you can think about generalizing this to process. Okay, from the distribution to a process. So given this empirical CDF, actually, besides this natural result from law of large numbers, we actually have a stronger result about its convergence. And why stronger in what sense? So here, for those of you who have some analysis background, right, you can see this is pointwise convergence for functions. We do this, we have this convergence for every x, but we cannot say much collectively for odd x in RD. But this stronger result tells us that collective behavior. And we call this the Levenko Cantelli theorem. So it's also about almost surely, but it's not the same as what we have there. So you see what we have here, if we write it out, is f and x converge to fx almost surely, okay? But what this says is, if you take the absolute difference in the domain Rd over, so taking the soup of x over its domain. So here I'm just saying it's Rd, just to be consistent with what we have there. But it could be it's a small you know, subset of Rd depending on the distribution. What this says is that the soup difference converges to zero, almost surely. So, you know, this implies that, but not vice versa. This is a stronger result. And this is related to the fact that that point-wise convergence of a series of functions doesn't imply this, this is called a uniform convergence. So just as a counter example, to help you understand the difference. Let's think about this function. Let's say f and x is equal to x squared over m plus x, while fx is simply x. And here, the x is just real value. Then you can see if I take the difference, f and x minus fx, what is it? It's actually x squared over m. And what's its behavior? For a fixed x, right? If x is fixed, we let n go to infinity, it will go down to zero. But if you take soup, it's different. You see, if you take the soup, it will not converge to zero because this x can be very, very large, right? And we know the soup is actually greater or equal than, we can actually say it's greater or equal than n squared over n by restricting this to be integer. And then you see this is converging to infinity as n goes to infinity. So that's why this is a counterexample showing that pointwise convergence doesn't imply this uniform convergence. But this glivenko cantani theorem actually tells us this nice uniform convergence. And what's the intuition behind this? The main reason is because of this nice property about CDF. So you see both the CDF by definition and this empirical CDF are between zero and one. So it's a bounded function. And that makes things a lot easier for us. So once it's bounded, I can always define my y range into very small intervals and find the corresponding breakpoints in the domain. 
And then therefore I can easily just make the two things very small universally, uniformly. Yeah, so that's the key idea behind the proof of this. So we are going to quickly prove this next time when we come back by using this point-wise convergence by the law of large numbers. So the idea is that once we break the zero to in one interval and find the corresponding X values at the breakpoint, then at the break, each breakpoint, we would have point-wise convergence. And we want to show that the two adjacent breakpoints have very similar Y values. So that's why we can actually bound that the soup. Okay, so that's all. So I think that's all for today. So we will finish this screen cantelli quickly next time. And then we will move on to a major topic of this class, the central limit theorem. So which is the major application for the convergence law. All right, so I'll see you on Wednesday.